it. Silk weaving originated with our ancestors. It's what sustains us. I am a 70-year-old grandmother with diabetes. Without silk work, I wouldn't even be here. We don't just live day to day anymore. We can plan for the future. Our hunger season is a thing of the past. With the money I made from the market, I was able to build a house. And I bought more silk cocoons. And I paid my children's school fees. I was even able to save money. That's never happened. We are now stronger in the face of poverty. My name is Ramalin. My family has been farming rice for generations. My mom did silk work at home so she could feed us. And I have been doing silk work since I was 11 years old. My eyesight has been failing because I could not afford diabetes medication. So I have been unable to work or to care for my animals. And what little money I could make, I spent on my health. I was in the hospital for over two months. Now, with the money I made from sales in America, I can get my diabetes medicine. And as you can see, my health is much better, and I'm very happy. This grandmother isn't dead yet, and she's free. Weaving silk is something we've learned from our ancestors. It's something taught to every generation. I have 11 children and 29 grandchildren, and almost all of them were living right here in my house. With the profits from the market in America, I built two houses for them to move to. Believe me, we are all a lot happier now. My name is Phil Bertin. I have been doing silk work since I got married in 1988 for 24 years. I am the president of the Sahalandi Federation. Since so many women are interested in producing silk, and it's a way to earn money, we started a federation of silk weavers. It's a way we can work together to improve what we do. My name is Natalie Mundy. I'm 25 years old. I'm a Peace Corps volunteer in Sandra Madagascar in the small enterprise development sector. When I first got to Sandranda and I, and I met the weavers of Sahalandi, I thought that they just needed any possible way to get their products from here to America. In this area of Madagascar, women are really known for doing silk work. Our silk is wild. It comes from cocoons harvested in the tapia forest. There's nowhere in the world that has the type of silk we have here in Madagascar. We want to make it famous all over the world. As soon as I found out about the Santa Fe International Folk Art Market, things really started moving for us. 
In October 2010, Natalie suggested that we should apply to be part of the market in Santa Fe, even though the deadline was already very close. There were a lot of questions for all of the members of the Federation to answer, and we scrambled to prepare all the details, information and samples. When Natalie told us we were accepted, we were really happy. Overnight, we started preparing our products so they could be exported in time. So we hit the ground running, we got all of our product together in my house so that it pretty much touched the ceiling. It was as if we all had new jobs and our lives changed quickly. We became very focused and the way we managed everything changed. Being accepted to the market made us get our act together. We organized ourselves and had a lot of meetings about management and about the techniques for dyeing and weaving. Every group chose a representative and we voted whenever there was a decision to be made. Now, it's how we decide everything, by voting. It was only a three-day fair, but we made $32,000. That's not no more for us, not no more at all. It would take us 15 years to make that much money here. As a group, we put 25% of our profits in an account to save towards our expenses for the next market. Then, we divided the earnings among our members according to their individual sales. Finally, we gave 3% of our profits as a bonus to our workers. I put some of the money from the market in the savings account and with a little financial planning, my husband and I were able to move from our rental home and buy a bigger house to renovate. A place where we could receive guests and where I have more room to do my silk business. Sahalandi is doing something collectively with their earnings after the Santa Fe International Folk Art Market. We had a number of meetings and a number of discussions, and they ended up deciding that they wanted to do three bungalows in a showroom because they're on an ecotourism circuit. So there's more and more tourists coming here in the summer months. Sahalandi is developing another business. We are constructing a showroom for selling our silk work and a place where visitors can stay. This created jobs for more people and is a source of honor for the entire community. In our culture, we have a tradition of paying respect to our dead by wrapping them in silk when they are buried. Years later, we bring them out of their tomb and into the sun to warm up their bones, then wrap them again in our very best silk when we return them to their resting place. 
You open the door to the tomb and you take the body out. And you bring it back to the village, wherever it's from. And they proceed to parade around with it for three to five days. In the past, silk cloth was only used to wrap our ancestors. Silk is rarely used to weave shrouds today because it is so expensive. But women still teach the skill to every young girl to preserve our culture. And now, we weave shawls, scarves, and clothing. The silk weavers are really successful now, but it's becoming increasingly rare to find the raw silk from Madagascar. People are burning down the forest of tapia trees to make charcoal and to use it for firewood. And they're making it completely unusable, just deforestation all over. You can see the forest has been burnt down. Ever since we found a market in America, competition for resources has increased. Other people have started going into the forest to collect the cocoons before we get there, then selling them to us for a higher price. It's frightening because they're not really sure if one day it will just all disappear. Having Judy Espinar come all the way here to Sundodon, Madagascar was probably one of the most incredible things I've ever seen in my whole service. Hey, here's a big guy. <laughs> they absolutely knew how important this was to what they were trying to do. And these are your children? All of them? They're beautiful. I'm too. Judith Espinar, the creative director of the Santa Fe International Folk Art Market. I'm also one of the founders. And I can't tell you how impressed I am with the way the women work in this federation. And they have a voice in every major decision. From how much the piece costs, will they be able to use chemical dyes? All of this will be decided as a group. This builds leadership for the future. Many of you ask the same question, what can we do differently to do more business? The spider web design on this scarf is very beautiful, very unusual. Women are going to love to wear it. What makes these colors so beautiful is that they're deeply embedded in the fibers. When you look at something that comes from a commercial dyer, you never see the, this beauty. So color will help to emphasize the exciting process that you are all engaged in. And I think it will help you to sell more merchandise. I'm gonna buy this one right away. I love it. 
Pruska shared what she learned in Santa Fe with all our members. With this training and the money from the market, we are better prepared to take charge of our own lives. And we can do the things that we want to do. Before, if we wanted anything, even salt, we had to ask our men for money and wait. Now, with our own money, we don't have to wait for anyone. At first, I admit I was a little concerned because in our culture, women have always taken care of the household while men earn the money. But after seeing how Priska's earnings helped her whole family, I realized that men and wife can work together as equals. My message for men is not to look at this as a bad thing. Sure, it's new for us, but it's a good thing. began to have financial management training so that they could decide how much money stayed in their house, how much they needed every month. They're developing not just an industry here, but they're developing a culture around financial literacy. And when an artist goes above the poverty line, it substantially impacts their education and their health usually means that they can send their children to school, that they have fed them nutritious food, and that they can learn. <laughs> the people in the community are really surprised. Wow, when we work really hard, we can be really successful. And then that has led to other people who do soap work in other parts of the country because they've heard about our success. When women believe that someone else cares about what they think, it changes every cell in the body of that artisan. Craftspeople not only need education, but they need markets. And they can understand after they experience a market that what they do is important to the world. Radu is the one that's going to be going to the Santa Fe International Folk Art Market this year. She has also recently gotten her bachelor's degree in management from a university in the capital. She has a large part to play in the new age development of the Federation. I am so excited to be traveling to a different country for the first time. I know I have a lot to learn, the way of life, the way of working with Americans. I have a bachelor's degree in management, so my education and my selling will go well together. And I will be able to use what I learned in Santa Fe while studying for my master's degree back home. Radu is the embodiment of many gifts, and she will share them and empower her own community with them. And these younger weavers that are coming along, learning how to weave from their mothers, are gonna say, look at Radu. This is an incredible example of a young role model. All the artists began our training programs right after we arrived. It's a great benefit that I will share with Federation members as soon as I return.
My name is Adina Zunkel and I'm the Director of Special Projects and I've been with the market for nine years. Each year about 20 to 25 artists receive sponsorship to come to the market and those artists are automatically put through this training program. So it's not just us teaching you, it's you teaching each other and us learning from each other. We cover costing and pricing. They learn the science side of it, which is what are your cost of materials? What is your time worth? And I think that's the big aha for many artists. Many artisans don't count the time that it takes them to do all the work as part of what the price should be. We have thought about this and worked on it and looked at other formulas from other artisan organizations. It's just so rewarding for us to know that this is actually helping them. Hey ladies. Hi. Hi. I miss you. How are you? Oh my God. How's it going? Are you having fun? Yeah. I'd say we've been doing pretty well. Yeah. How have you been? I've been great. We kind of gauge things by the thickness of the receipts. And yesterday was pretty thick. And today is also pretty thick, so. I think we're doing really well. I feel like I belong with all the other artists. And I am happy that people like our products so much. I am proud that Sahaland is included in this group of world artists, representing our traditions. We really are part of a global community. I think it's definitely true that access to markets is creating a whole different kind of leader in developing countries all over the world. When we think about the fact that folk artists are the voices of cultures that have been passed down, sometimes for more than several hundred years, we realize that this is a language that we need to protect. We've also learned how important it is to bring people together in an international celebration of art and joy. They are the culture bearers that are continuing their artistic traditions and moving them forward. They've seen the enormous potential that they have to sell abroad. They walk around with this whole new confidence about them. changes everything.